distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and a warm welcome to one and all to the 13th RK Talwar Memorial Lecture. My name is Soumya, Joint Director Academics IIBF and your host for today's evening. I now request Mr. Biswagedan Das, CEO IIBF to kindly escort Dr. V. Anand Nageshwaran, Chief Economic Advisor, Government of India, and Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman SBI and President IIBF to the dais. I now request Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman SBI and President IIBF, to welcome Dr. Anant Nageshwaran, Chief Economic Advisor, Government of India, with a bouquet of flowers and preside over the function. I request Mr. Biswagedan Das, CEO IIBF, to welcome Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman SBI and President IIBF, with a bouquet of flowers. We are honored to have the ED of RBI and the Managing Directors of SBI 2 in this August presence. May I now request Mr. Prakash Mehrotra, Director Training IIBF, to welcome Mr. Ajay Kumar, EDRBI, with a bouquet of flowers. May I now request Mr. Francis Amalanathan, Director Operations IIBF, to welcome Mr. Ashwini Kumar Tiwari, MDSBI with a bouquet of flowers. I request Mr. Prakash Mehrotra again to welcome Mr. Alok Kumar Chaudhary, MDSBI with a bouquet of flowers. I request Mr. Francis to welcome Mr. Ajit Kumar Rath, Chief Vigilance Officer, SVI, with a bouquet of flowers. Today, we also have amongst us Mr. Jay Talwar, a member of the Talwar family. A very warm welcome to you, sir. May I request Mr. Prakash Mehrotra to welcome Mr. Jay Talwar with a bouquet of flowers. Ladies and gentlemen, we commence the event. But before that, a humble request. Kindly put your mobile phones in the silent mode. Sri Rajkumar Talwar was born on June 3, 1922. He joined the Imperial Bank of India at Lahore in November 1943 as a probationary assistant and went on to become the youngest chairman of SBI during 1969 to 76. He was also the governing council member, the vice president and president of the Indian Institute of Banking and Finance, formerly known as the Indian Institute of Bankers. He contributed immensely to the growth of IABF also. State Bank of India has instituted this annual memorial lecture in memory of Sri R.K. Talwar. The admirers of Sri R.K. Talwar from amongst the pensioners, existing staff of the bank, and some outsiders collected funds to create an endowment to perpetuate his memory and recall his role or contribution in the growth and development of the bank. SBI, on its part, contributed a matching amount, and the same was given to IIBF as the corpus for holding this annual event. 
The first R.K. Dalwar Memorial Lecture was held in 2007 and was delivered by none other, none other than Dr. C. Rangarajan, former governor RBI, on the Indian banking system challenges ahead. Since then, renowned personalities from the banking and finance fraternity have been invited to deliver lectures on contemporary economic and banking topics. So far, 12 lectures have been organized by the Institute. The last lecture was delivered by Mr. M. Rajeshwar Rao, Deputy Governor RBI on Reflecting on Policy Choices in the Indian Financial System. The lecture delivered by him received an overwhelming response. Today, we have with us Dr. V. Anant Nageshwaran, Chief Economic Advisor, Government of India, for delivering the 13th R.K. Talwar Memorial Lecture on a very relevant and pertinent topic titled, The Role of Regulation in Economic Development. May I now request Mr. Biswaketan Das, CEO IIBF, to kindly deliver the welcome address. A very good afternoon and warm welcome to all of you. Dignitaries on the dais, dignitaries of the dais, dignitaries who have joined live through YouTube and uh, Facebook. On behalf of IIBF, I welcome all to this 13th RK Memorial Lecture today, organized in collaboration with State Bank of India. We at State Bank always try to follow the footsteps of great leaders like Late Sri RK Talwar and believe in serving the citizens of uh, India following their aspirations. Big or small, State Bank for all. We re remember our own slogan, now the banker to every Indian. That is why State Bank is known with the Indians. The name R.K. Talwar evokes respect and admiration not only from State Bank of India, but from the entire banking sector of India. Uh, Sri Talwar joined the Imperial Bank of India as a probationary officer in 43 and rose to become the chairman at the age of 49, youngest chairman of State Bank of India till date. But it is not he, this achievement in his career which makes him unique in the annals of leadership. What makes Sri Talwar stand apart as a leader is his exemplary character, moral courage, spirited dedication, which inspired countless young bank officers to lead a life of integrity and values. More than these achievements, the reputation of honesty and integrity enjoyed by him in the industry drew the administration of everyone with respect to his views in the banking sector. And he was considered as the spokesperson of the industry during his uh, tenure. So Talwar was easily the most eminent banker in his times. His leadership was characterized by an outstanding intellect, honesty, integrity, strong commitment of purpose with indomitable courage. This lecture is a tribute to the legacy of late Sri R.K. Talwar, his life and influence. Once a leader said to his follower, be careful where you walk, the follower replied, you be careful, remember that I follow you in your footsteps. So we will follow the footsteps of R.K. Talwar, that is the expectation of this uh, lecture. To deliver this prestigious lecture today, we have with us Dr. V. Ananta Nageswaran, noted economist, popular columnist, acknowledged teacher, and presently the Chief Economic Advisor, Government of India. Sir, on behalf of IIBF and SBI, and all present in this auditorium, I welcome you, and sincerely thank you for finding time and come physically here to deliver the lecture. A multifaceted person, having wide-ranging knowledge and experience in banking and education, his choice of topic for today's lecture, the role of regulation in economic development, is important to understand the regulatory challenges in a complex banking world. A robust regulatory framework is sine qua non for the growth of the financial sector. I am also privileged to welcome Sri Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman, State Bank of India, and President of Indian Institute of Banking and Finance. 
for all his support in the activities of IIFF, particularly for this lecture. In the result-oriented corporate environment, Sri Khara has proved himself as an efficient, effective leader par excellence. Under his dynamic leadership, State Bank has transitioned from traditional transaction-focused model to a more customer-centric model. The results of SBI, quarter on quarter, the results of SBI, quarter on quarter, the movement of share prices are silent indicators of his success. He inspires confidence and respect, not only from the officers from State Bank of India, from the entire banking fraternity. I welcome you, sir. I heartily welcome the MDs of State Bank of India. They have laid their verticals admirably from the front. In a dynamic financial services landscape, they are effectively navigating the challenges in a fast-changing banking sector. Welcome to all the MDs. And I also welcome the ED of RBI, Mr. Ajay Kumar, who was also a guiding force in our governing council of IIBF. I welcome you, sir. And Mr. Rath, sir, I also welcome you, the CBO of State Bank of India. I welcome the DMDs and CGMs of State Bank of India, GMs and DGMs of State Bank of India, all the officers from State Bank, as well as other banks and RBI. Uh, the CGM RBI is also present here. So I welcome all uh, to the print and uh, uh, electronic media also to this uh, lecture. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for that welcome address. I now request Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman SBI and President IABF, to kindly say a few words about the lecture and give his views on the topic. Thank you, sir. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and very good evening to all of you. My special thanks to Dr. Nageshwaran for having taken out time and to be with us on this very momentous occasion, particularly when it comes to Aketarwal Memorial Lecture, I think, for the generation of bankers, he has set the examples, which will probably be the back on for many, many years and decades to come. When it comes to this particular event, which is Aketarwal Memorial Lecture, it's a landmark event in the annals of SBI and IIBF. Shri Talwar was the chairman of the bank during 69 to 76. It was a bit of a turbulent time also. Not many of us will perhaps know, but yes. And turbulent time in the economies always get reflected into the banking system. He continues to command a high degree of respect among all the bankers for the significant role which he played in shaping the bank at that very material time. His exemplary leadership qualities still inspires the bankers of the current generation. He was a man of principles, principles which have stood the test of time. As a mark of respect to this great leader and to perpetuate his memory and to commemorate a significant contribution to the banking industry as a whole, and State Bank in particular. This particular lecture is being organized annually by IIBF in coordination with State Bank of India. Shri Talwar was also one of the governing council members, vice president and the president of IIBF, and in these capacities contributed immensely to the growth of not only the institution but to the industry because IIBF is always known to be the alma mater for all the bankers. With his in-depth knowledge and experience, he was instrumental in initiating various measures to improve the academic and, and the training activities of the institute, which has actually helped in building up the foundation of the banking system in the country. I am thankful to IIBF for successfully organizing this prestigious lecture since 2007. It gives me immense pleasure to be part of this 13th Arke Memorial Lecture. 
In the past, many eminent speakers have delivered the lecture on various topics. Today, we are privileged to have with us Dr. Nageshwan, who is taking up a topic which is of significant relevance in the today's context, the role of regulation in the economic development. Financial sector across the globe are always very tightly regulated, but they have a very important role to play in the development of any economy. Particularly, Indian economy, at the cusp of becoming a developed economy, the role of the, of the regulator is of immense value, and it must be seen in the correct perspective. I thank Dr. Nageshwaran for accepting our invitation and choosing a contemporary topic that is critical to the functioning of the sector. With the groundbreaking advancement in technology, the entire financial ecosystem has been in the process of realigning and reinventing itself to match the changing customer expectations, geopolitical issues, and the volatility in the banking system in many of the developed countries also have brought the focus back on the financial regulations and the robust risk management. While there are many risks which we have seen in the past, but the newer risks which are emerging are perhaps beyond the imagination of anybody. How to stay resilient in such kind of environment is one of the major challenge, and how can actually regulation or the regulator help in navigating the industry in the safer territory is even a bigger challenge. Despite these global headwinds, we have seen that the Indian economy and the domestic financial system has managed to stay resilient, supported by the strong macroeconomic fundamentals. A series of policy measures which were taken by central government and RBI during the most difficult period of COVID has actually helped in moderating inflation, narrowing the current account deficit and infusing liquidity to the market to support the growth of the economy. India is expected to grow to around at the pace of almost what 7 percent during 24 and beyond and well poised to become a 7 trillion economy by the year 2030. Indian banking and financial sector will continue their upward growth trajectory on the back of the robust domestic demand, expanding private consumption and growing industrial activities. The market is upbeat that the structural reforms will revive the investment cycle too. Well-documented, transparent, durable regulations and the policy guidelines are sine qua non to economic development. Regulations not only safeguard the end users from the shortcoming of the market forces, but also helps in the orderly growth of the economy. In the dynamic landscape of financial ecosystem, the regulation serves as the guiding principles that assist in navigating towards a sustainable economic growth. In this backdrop, the today's deliberation by our speaker, Dr. Nageshwaran, on the subject, the role of regulation in it, economic development, I am sure will be of much greater interest for all of us as bankers. I am sure the lecture will be of immense significance for the professionals and as well as for us in particular as well in navigating the turbulent weather going forward. Thank you very much. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now request Mr. Viswaketan Das to introduce our speaker, Dr. V. Anantinageshwaran, to the audience. Dr. V. Anant Nageshwaran was a writer, author, teacher, and consultant before being appointed as the Chief Economic Advisor in January 2022. He has written a weekly mint column for 15 years on Tuesdays since 2007. He has co-authored four books. He has authored, co-authored four books, The Rise of Finance, Causes, Consequences, and Cures, Derivatives, Can India Grow? 
the economics of derivatives. He has taught at several business schools and institutes of management in India and in Singapore. He was the dean of the IFMR Graduate School of Business and a distinguished visiting professor of economics at Kriya University. He was one of the founders of Aviskar Venture Capital Fund and Taksila Institution. He has served on the academic advisory board of DAV schools in Tamil Nadu and the Indian School of Public Policy. He was a part-time member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India from 2019 to 2021. In his corporate career spanning 17 years from 1994 to 2011, he was a currency economist at the Union Bank of Switzerland, head of research and investment consulting in Credit Suisse private banking in Asia, head of Asia Research and Global Chief Investment Officer at Bank Julius Beer. He was an independent director on the boards of TVS Supply Chain Solutions, Sundaram Fasteners, TVS C Chakra Tires, Delphi TVS, and Aparajita Corporate Services. In 1985, he received a postgraduate diploma in management from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. He earned his doctoral degree from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in 1994 for his work on exchange rate behavior. An illustrious person in the Indian economic scenario, sir. Welcome. Please, welcome to you. Mr. Dinesh Kumar Kara, Chairman State Bank of India. Mr. Bishwaketan Das, CEO, Indian Institute of Banking and Finance, senior officials from the Bank of India, from the State Bank of India, and banking fraternity, ladies and gentlemen. It is doubly humbling for me to be chosen to deliver the 13th Sri R.K. Talwar Memorial Lecture. First, it is an honor and also an exercise in humility to be able to speak about a distinguished son of India, to speak at a lecture instituted in his honor. I have first heard about him from Mr. Wagul when I was briefly associated with Kriya University. He has spoken a lot about Mr. Talwar and how he learned a lot from him during his earlier years in banking. It is often said that in the long run, institutions shape individuals, but people like him were the exception to the rule that it is individuals who shape the institutions, not only of the institution that they headed, <laughs> not only of the institution that they headed, but they also inspire other institutions in the process of their functioning. It is not that they go out of the way to do this. It is the very intrinsic nature of their personality that brings about this transformative change. I know that, in fact, more than any of, uh, more than me, almost all of you present here would know the signal contributions he made to the field of banking in India with respect to the analysis of corporate sector when it comes to banking decisions, the initiatives he took to encourage SME financing in the country, and also many launched several new schemes to support small entrepreneurs, businessmen, and farmers, etc. The list goes on. The list is endless. So in that sense, it is a very important privilege, and I'm deeply grateful to IIBF and State Bank of India for having chosen me to deliver this lecture. The second reason to be humble about is that I am following in the footsteps of very distinguished speakers, starting from Dr. Sri Rangarajan in 2007. And therefore, I fully understand the responsibility that rests on my shoulders as I begin to speak on the topic that I have chosen today. It is normally understood that regulation is a response to market failure. I personally believe that's an incomplete statement, even though it is not wrong. 
Sometimes the very nature of markets requires the inevitable presence of regulators and regulation. So regulation is not a response only to market failure. Sometimes regulation is indeed a response or a complement to markets themselves. It is a response also to growth and scale. I heard from a philosopher that progress for humans is their innate ability to complicate simplicity. And therefore, the very development of scale and complexity requires regulation because as things become complex, the inherent limitations of humans comes to the fore and it requires some amount of supervision and policing to happen. So regulation is not just a response to markets themselves, market failures, but also to growth and growth in scale and complexity. Because as activities explode and become interconnected, we need order to make it flow smoothly and take place without too much friction. The need for regulation therefore arises as the economy grows in size and with the rate of growth and also with the rate of complexity. As Mr. Kara pointed out, today we are on the cusp of becoming the top three largest economies in the world. And the scale of financing that we would require to make this growth translate into a difference in the lives of ordinary people means that regulators have to ensure that the growth of the industry, for that matter any industry, serves the ultimate purpose of making a difference to the lives of the ordinary Indians. Apart from these, regulation is also a response to human nature. Are we good at self-policing? We do need the MC of every event to tell us to put our phones on silent mode. At the same time, no MC can tell us not to keep looking at our screen every 32 seconds. It has become a part and parcel of our daily existence and behavior. And humans in general are not very good at self-policing. We need external incentives, inducements, and even disciplining devices to keep us on, the, to keep us on track with respect to our own chosen behavior. Therefore, we have to usually find ways to let others hold us to our resolutions. Whether it is on simple matters like weight loss, smoking, alcohol consumption, or something as complex as financial sector regulation, we do need an external agency to enforce certain things that are desirable in our own interest. There is a third dimension to regulation. In general, in the marketplace, and that too in a large country like ours, literacy levels are still in catch-up mode. The relative power of the sellers and producers versus the consumers is often tilted in favor of the farmer, the sellers and producers. This imbalance is rectified by having the state or the regulator take the side of the consumer, protecting her interest and rights. So therefore, regulation has this important consideration in its favor. Of course, in reality, there is the political economy as well, which doesn't necessarily keep the balance between sellers and producers on one side, the public and the regulator on the other side, the scales are not often evenly balanced, and political economy usually tilts it in one direction or the other. So I believe I have spent the last few minutes successfully, I hope so, in establishing the principle that regulation is necessary and not a necessary evil. It is necessary, full stop. But then it becomes a matter of detail with respect to execution. As always, the devil or the angel is in the details of regulation. 
If regulation is indeed inevitable, how do we get it right? And how do we do it right? Let me break it down into two parts. Regulation in the financial sector and regulation in the non-financial sector. In the financial sector, in particular, given the audience that I'm facing, the importance of regulation doesn't even have to be established. It is a given. Because at times of failure, like for example, what happened with the Silicon Valley Bank last year, and for that matter, in previous episodes of crisis, when the industry goes through periods of stress and failures, public commentary or legislatures usually turn to regulators and ask the question, what were you doing? In fact, it is somewhat amusing and instructive to know that the public and their elected representatives hold the regulators sometimes more responsible than the managements themselves for such institutional failures. So that establishes the necessity for regulation. And second reason, when financial institutions fail, and I'm not speaking in particular about India, but more in the global context, they do run to the public sector to help bail them out. And we know that in the global context, if not necessarily in the Indian context, rewards to risk taking accrue to the private employees and executives of financial institutions and the adverse consequences of failures usually end up on the taxpayer. So it is often said that while the rewards are privatized, the costs are socialized. And given that, therefore, the moment public money gets involved in bailing out or rescuing institutions, it goes without saying that a government that is the lost resort when institutions fail also naturally acquires the right to regulate the industry's conduct so that such bailout situations become at least infrequent if not absolutely unnecessary or impossible. And that is the reason why in the financial sector we don't talk about the need for regulation at all because the principle or the premise is established beyond doubt. The question therefore that arises once we accept this basic premise, should regulations be principles based or prescriptive in nature? It is easy, given the way the question is posed, it is easy to plumb for the former, that is, regulation should be principles based. But there are some, some dangers, especially in finance. Often, and I myself have spent nearly a couple of decades in the financial services industry, and I know that the industry can and does run rings around principle based regulation. It is subject to interpretation when, it is sub when the regulation is largely principles-based. Whether a principle is violated or not is equivalent to the idea of beauty being in the eye of the beholder. In other words, when regulation is structured on the premise of largely being principles-based, it gives a lot of freedom to the regulated entities to behave responsibly. In that sense, the freedom goes with the responsibility because principles-based regulation gives more rights and freedom to the regulated. In general, in households, children get more freedom if they can demonstrate, at the minimum, no self-harm, isn't it? Therefore, in the case of finance as well, the industry can and should get more freedom if it demonstrates not only no self-harm, but also no social harm. But what about the regulators? What is it that we need to enjoin upon them? Just as humans in general are incapable of self-policing, there is a tendency also on the part of regulators to engage in excess policing. Both tendencies exist. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Stanford experiment. 
when a bunch of people on the street were picked up for an experiment, they didn't know each other from other, they, they, they didn't know one from the other before.
and therefore a micro and small it is usually very small is disproportionately allocated or dedicated towards compliance rather than business development or human resource management etc so in that sense there is a lot of work that remains to be done in the country both at the national level and at the sub national level for regulations to become more principle based rather than prescriptive especially when it comes to the non financial sector also i would love to leave one more question for the regulatory framework when it comes to the non financial sector it ought to be a function of the objectives and the national economic goals that we wish to pursue the question in front of regulators is this is the goal given the state of development of the country given the state of per capita income of around $2500 as we aspire to go towards middle income status where it is somewhere between $5000 to $11000 therefore given this should the objective function of regulators be one of the following two should it be maximizing economic activity subject to zero non compliance with rules and regulations subject to maximum facilitation of economic activity these are two different objective functions one cannot at the same time optimize both just as you cannot minimize both type 1 and type 2 errors and you have to choose in quality control you know what to choose if you are a very consumer oriented company you will obviously err on the side of ensuring that i would not mind even one good quality product unit to to be cast aside but i will not defective it is like in jurisprudence saying that we may let some guilty people escape the rule of law but we will never convict an innocent person so there is a choice that is being made there similarly when it comes to regulation and compliance we have to make a choice do we want to ensure that not a single person escapes the rule of law but in the process i will not mind putting to harm and inconvenience some 10 other innocent businesses and people or do we choose the alternative which is that i will ensure that 90% of the population which is largely compliant and law abiding to be able to pursue their economic activity unhindered and i will not mind letting 5 or 10 escape the rule of law because i am more focused on ensuring that economic activity proceeds unhindered what is the trade off i think that trade off that question has not been fully grappled with or addressed in the context of the regulatory framework that this country needs to have because both cannot be done at the same time governments across the country not at the national level but also at the sub national level must make this choice until now in the first 75 years of independence or more we have tilted towards the first objective function which is we maximize economic activity but only subject to zero non compliance which also gives rise to lot of other adverse consequences such as rent seeking etc but given the country's growth and development aspirations there is a case to be made for the second objective function to be chosen which is that we minimize non compliance but subject to maximum facilitation of economic activity once this objective function is set and articulated then it has to be reflected in the governance of regulatory institutions that means we it has to be reflected in the policies made decisions taken and implemented as well it means there has to be accountability for governance and that boils down to how public servants are evaluated and appraised for their own compliance with this objective function in other words the regulation of state administration and governance becomes an important task in itself if this framework is not in place and not followed 
then the state will be effectively failing to regulate itself. And naturally, it will not be able to regulate non-state actors effectively as a consequence. Therefore, if the state and its organs cannot regulate themselves, then they cannot regulate the economy efficiently and effectively. And last but not the least, related to state capacity for regulation is the question of state capability. How well trained and capable are our regulators with respect to microeconomics? The theory of the firm, price setting behavior, theory of competition, etc. What are the microeconomic foundations in our undergraduate courses and in the various foundation courses in Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration? Of course, this opens up another strand of discussion with respect to regulatory environment in the country on the need for specialists versus generalists and the length of tenure that civil servants need to have to acquire specialization skills, not just be generalists. Because the economy, as it grows in complexity, we need to ask ourselves fundamental questions as to whether the current structure, which has served us reasonably well, after all, we were an economy of $300 billion in 1993. And today, we are a $3.4 trillion economy, poised to become 3.7 by the end of March 2024. So we have grown more than 12 times in dollar terms, despite rupee depreciating almost 3% every year on average. So we have done very well. And in fact, many of you will say, or maybe thinking as I speak, we might have become a $3 trillion economy, but China that started out at the same time has become an $18 trillion economy. I would simply like you to go back to your computers back home in the evening and divide the nominal GDP by the amount of debt that both the economies carry and figure out what is the per unit of GDP for one unit of debt that India has compared to China, for example. And in that, by that metric, we have done quite well. So the point is, the structure that we have today has served us by and large quite well. But it is always necessary, essential, and desirable to ask the question, should this structure be evaluated, examined, and reviewed for its suitability for the kind of economy that we will likely have going forward with the invasion of artificial intelligence other forms of technology, and climate considerations coming in the way of our economic development and growth aspirations. What is the right mix of generalists and specialists, both in the administrative functions and in the regulatory functions? I know that this is a different topic for a different occasion, but the concept of the role of regulators in economic development is that, while, as I laid out at the very beginning, it is necessary and desirable. Ultimately, the regulatory structure, just as it reviews the regulated entities, the regulatory structure, its functioning, performance, and effectiveness also have to be periodically reviewed for it to remain contemporary, purposeful, and if it were to not lose sight of the ultimate goal for a developing country, which is that the living standards and aspirations must continuously make progress and that future generations should feel that not only do they have a life which is better than their predecessors, preceding generations, but their own future generations will have a life better than them. I hope I have left some thoughts with you to ponder about. And once again, I thank IIBF and State Bank of India for giving me this opportunity to join a galaxy of very extraordinary personalities who have delivered this lecture, and for me to be able to share my thoughts with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for this very enriching, enlightening speech, and I think bringing out the different aspects and facets of a regulation. And it's also given an exercise for us to ponder on something on the GDP. Thank you, sir. So now, 
The floor is open for a question answer session. Regulatory framework norm. Many times we find that regulatory institutions are a little behind the curve and the market finds ways of scuttling it or is it that the regulator is not able to anticipate the changes which are likely to come? That is my first question. Then how do we ensure coordination amongst regulatory institutions? Is it, does it exist now? Or do we need, a, need an institutional framework for that? My two questions. So if I heard you correctly, the first question is about how do regulators keep up with the regulated entities? Obviously, it is a question that uh, is relevant not just for India, but several countries around the world. Because the resources that are placed at the disposal of regulators also happens to be a function of the political ideology of the governing personalities and the political parties. Because we know, for example, in the in some of the advanced economies, if you believe in the self-policing abilities of the markets, then the regulating, regulatory entities tend to get short shrift. But if the governing, if the government of the day believes in the power of the state to intervene, then they equip the regulators with greater resources Etc. So therefore, that is one element that influences the regulatory capability. And secondly, it is also not possible for non-profit making entities to be able to offer the kind of compensation that attracts the talent and the skill necessary, which the private sector is normally in a position to be able to offer. So it is very, just by the very sh nature of the uh, uh, behavioral structures of the regulated and the regulators, talent will always be scarce with respect to regulators. So in fact, a certain amount of public spirit needs to compensate for this compensation gap that exists so that regulators can have the capacity to be able to do so. But there are no easy answers both to your first question and the second question also about um, on? The, the coordination amongst regulatory agencies. Coordination, coordination. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, while it may appear somewhat complex when we use the word coordination, it boils down to communication, establishing channels of communication, and also establishing channels of communication with the administrative ministries and departments. So that I think more often than not, what happens is that uh, there is a certain sense of ad hocism that might creep in when we respond to situations. That is inevitable. And in the process, it is not just necessary for coordination across institutions, but also coordination within the same institution. And even in a small organization, there needs to be always one or two devil's advocates whose job is to sort of step back. I remember, for example, this quote uh, which I read in the book, uh, The Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto. This quote is attributed to Justice Learned Hand in the UK, and apparently he said, it is not necessary for me often to side with the majority opinion, because by sheer definition, there are many others to do it. So given a particular prevailing wisdom or thought in a group, it is probably necessary to vest someone with the authority and the power to always articulate the 
point of view that is not expressed inside the room. If we do that, then some of the contradictions that arise between different regulators or between the regulator and the administrative departments or ministries can be avoided. So it is not just a question of uh, uh, communication between regulators, but it's also a question of how much of openness that prevails inside organizations, whether it is regulated entities or regulators, that will make a big difference and may even largely obviate the need for such coordination and communication. Thank you, sir. Sir, extending the thought between the coordinator and the regulators, can you have a role of a super regulator so that it can be modified or something, some adjustments can be done? This goes back to the point I made in the, my remarks, you know, uh, progress is man's innate ability to complicate simplicity. And then we may end up having too many super regulators, and we may have to have a super, super regulator. So I think there is no end to all of that. I think uh, it, it depends on the organizational culture to be able to ask questions of itself from time to time. And one can create mechanisms at the institutional level to be able to do so, in which case a super regulator may not be necessary. So I, it is difficult to give a general answer to your question. Uh, good evening, Dr. Nagashan. It has been very enchanting. Uh, now we have uh, different heroes whom we watch on YouTube. You are being one of them. Uh, various lectures of you I watch on the YouTube. Uh, this particular uh, uh, that you took us from the uh, how the regulation works as a part of market failure, you took us to the prescriptive and the, the principle-based regulation. You also took us to that Stanford experiment. Our regulation, are uh, we continue to based on the Western thought, Western philosophy. Like if I uh, simply talk about Basel III, a simple example if I give, uh, we define a group, so uh, various entities, uh, say if I, let us say Tata group, so various entities on the Tata group are combined to define a group and the ability of the banks is kept on the group level. This, uh, constitution of or composition of the group in India is quite different that you see in the West. Should we continue to be led by the concepts that have originated the, the West or we can have a relook on those kind of things? What is your view, please? So it will be presumptuous of me to pretend that I have an answer to your specific question of this particular example that you took, so I won't venture there. But the overall principle that you laid out, which is that should we necessarily adopt uh, some of the structures and practices of other countries which were developed in consonance with their uh, <clears throat> economic context, so also social and cultural context, that question answers itself. We should not. That is, we need to understand that some of the community-based practices and our own pathways have contributed to the development of certain practices. And in many cases, we, we can also use, and not particularly to the example that you talk about, in many cases one relies on peer group pressures, et cetera, to act as regulatory mechanisms rather than official uh, sanctions working. If some of them could be more effective. So the short answer, again, uh, unfortunately, not a prescriptive but a principle-based answer is that, yes, obviously, not just uh, regulatory practices, but anything and everything that we do, especially when it comes to economic behavior, has to be relevant and tailored to the context. And the context includes not just the current context, but also the historical path dependence that we have followed. Uh, in the in US, the recent failure of SVB, is it because of regulation or lack of regulation? What about you say? It had a contagion effect, of course. So would you, how do you define the failure of SVB and a few others later on? Of course, 
the uh, the monetary authorities and government try to extricate themselves from it. I, I would like to sort of have your view on that. No, I think uh, whether the failure of SVB is due to excess regulation or lack of regulation is not a very easy question to answer because it could also be due to lack of regulation with respect to how some of the compensation and incentive structures are designed as well where the as i mentioned in my initial remarks where the rewards are privatized and the consequences are socialized right so we know that it is not as if the monetary policy changes that were happening in the United States suddenly happened one day. The interest rates did not go from 0 to 5% in one single move. It happened over a period. And therefore, for the management of the institution not to have taken cognizance of that, and uh, we learned that there were not enough uh, risk management functions or risk officers in place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is. As I said, it's very difficult to assign responsibility. I would normally assign the primary responsibility to the institutions themselves before we uh, 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 pick on the regulators' failures uh, as, as one of the causes for it. Sir, uh, my question is exactly about currency. See, despite uh, growth in economy and upbeat of markets, why the rupee is still sliding year on year? Why the rupee? Rupee is sliding against dollar year on year. That's not quite true. And I think the fundamental principle of any exchange rate behavior, if at all, you know, there may be plenty of theories. But as long as we have an inflation rate that is different from the inflation rate of the anchor currency, then over a long time, long period, inflation differential determines the uh, exchange rate trend. That is over long horizons. But there could be periods when this is kind of, this becomes muted. For example, between 2003 and 8, uh, our currency appreciated against the US dollar, and that resumed in 2009 to 11. But then, unfortunately, the underlying inflation trends did not change in India's favor. Because of that, the currency became overvalued in real terms, and we experienced what we experienced in 2012 to 13 as well. So if you look at, for example, the exchange rate of the United States dollar versus the British pound in the last one century, on average, the British pound has depreciated by 1% every year against the US dollar. Guess the inflation differential between the US and UK, 1%. So ultimately, if you have to have, if you want to have a currency that appreciates, currency is like a thermometer. It cannot, the underlying body temperature is what it reflects. And the temperature it reflects is the inflation differential. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the competitiveness and productivity of the economy, relative economies. So uh, it cannot, you cannot have a strong currency in and of itself without having the underlying drivers facilitated and be consistent with that. Because our import bill is more, so where uh, we need strong currency so that we get more value. But otherwise, <laughs> we are always uh, uh, having a weak currency where uh, we, we yeah. cannot yeah, buy that is right. valuable the, things abroad. That, that is the question. Sorry? Say, as and when we have the weak currency, we cannot buy valuable things abroad. Absolutely. Yeah. It cuts both ways. Yeah. Uh, a, a continuously weak currency is not only one that will make your imports costlier, especially if you have essential imports, but it also can sometimes make investors postpone their investment because they will always know that next year the currency will be even cheaper, right? So I understand that. But it is not something that can be engineered overnight. It depends on your ability to achieve a particular level of price stability, which in turn comes from productivity and competitiveness then the currency will automatically uh, uh, reflect that. So we need to work on these underlying drivers, it will be long, which long is what we are doing. And I think, for example, the, uh, the kind of physical infrastructure which we have created over the last decade or so should enable this kind of productivity improvement to happen in the economy. The reason why you have a persistent import uh, trade, uh, um, trade deficit 
is obviously because your production capacity has not been adequate to meet the consumption demand in the economy, whether it is for industrial purposes or for consumption purposes. The more we are able to create that supply side capabilities within the economy, then naturally, but these things don't happen overnight, then naturally the currency will begin to reflect that. I think we are on the right path. Good evening, sir. Uh, my question is pertaining to the role of disclosure in effective regulation. Now, the regulator entities are expected to disclose more and more as that is uh, considered to be a very effective way of regulation. How about uh, the regulators themselves? Whether the disclosure on their part also uh, will uh, make the regulations more effective or like you said in the one example that it may uh, seem like uh, shouting fire in a in a full theater. Again, there are no easy answers to this question, but what kind of disclosures you would like to mandate for the regulator? Uh, not mandate, sir. When certain actions are taken, the full disclosure of the reasons for the actions that will make it more effective for the other. Uh, now, I understand, but uh, again, it is very difficult to give. Uh, a general answer to the question saying, yes, regulators must disclose the, the, the underlying reasons for their action at all times. It's very difficult to make a blanket statement such as that, even though one can agree in principle, because nobody can stand up and say, I am against disclosure. Just as, just as it is difficult for someone to stand up and say, I am against uh, financial innovations, because by definition, the word innovation is a normative sounding word, isn't it? Nobody can stand up in a room and say, I'm against innovation. Then you would be considered a Luddite, right? But then you know that some innovations are good, some innovations are harmful, etc. Similarly, I cannot stand up and say that disclosure, I'm not in favor of disclosure. So then the question automatically makes it a bias question in favor of more disclosure. But then all such statements come with their trade-offs. At what point and at what situations uh, more disclosure will be useful or will, what is the kind of cost it will create? So for the regulator to be able to disclose every single logic or reason that they used to enforce a particular action, that is why I said in the eyes and minds of the public, the regulator is always considered uh, sort of a bully. And the person who is being uh, scrutinized is always considered the underdog. But regulators have a certain obligation, which unfortunately, it goes with the turf, that they have to accept this kind of criticism, that they are not disclosing enough. Therefore, the reasons for their actions will always be perceived as opaque and non-transparent. which it is, it is an intrinsic feature. It's an occupational hazard. So one cannot, therefore, make a blanket statement that regulators should also become more open and disclose all their reasons because it can create other consequences. Because when it comes to public policy, there are two iron laws. There will always be unintended consequences. Two, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So regulators will have to be mindful of that as well. So it is a thankless job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, you know, when you mentioned about the circular on unsecured retail lending, alongside that, the RBI also came out with a circular on NBFCs. And recently, um, in the discussion by RBI with MD CEO of banks, they again mentioned about liquidity exposures of banks to NBFCs. So do you think while NBFC is a segment which is also under the regulatory purview of the RBI, as we grow as an economy, this is one segment, whenever we talk about credit excesses in the system on adequate liquidity, this is the first sector that comes under the vigil. RBI has definitely been preemptive. But do you see as we grow, there are some sections of the financial sector where the regulator needs to up the ante in terms of vigil, and specifically on NBFC, sir, what's your view? Thank you. 
I kind of uh, take it that it is not a question as much as a statement in itself. Uh, the answer, therefore, is relatively easy for me. The answer is yes. conclude with the question answer session now. Thank you, sir. And it has been definitely interactive to see the audience also asking quite uh, uh, pertinent questions to the CEA. As mentioned earlier, we are indeed honored to have Mr. Jay Talwar amongst us, a member of the Talwar family. So before I call upon Mr. Jay Talwar to say a few words, a brief introduction about Mr. Jay Talwar. Mr. Jay Talwar is the nephew of Sri Rajkumar Talwar and is presently working as a senior vice president, India Infrastructure Publishing Private Limited. He is an advertising and media professional having over 35 years of experience and has worked in senior positions with Reader's Digest, Business India, Business World and ZT. Sir, request you to kindly come on to the dais and say a few words. Hello, uh, good evening. First and foremost, uh, I thank you, for, uh, Dr. Nageshwan, for a very informative and enlightening lecture. So my earliest uh, memories of my uncle was visiting him at his SBI residence in Kolkata when I was about six years old. He was extremely close to my father, who was suffering from an enlarged heart. As there was no cure then, my father passed away in 1963 when I was eight years old. But Mr. Talwar kept in touch and would visit us every time he would come to Kolkata. My mother used to tell me that he was so upright about financial dealings that he would not accept any gifts uh, or give any amongst family members. The only time I requested something from him was when he allowed me to use his name as a reference on my CV. And I landed my first job with the reputed Clarion Advertising as a branch head, was impressed that I was related. We were so proud when we heard that he stood his ground about a project loan in 1976 for a famous car firm which irked the then Prime Minister. And in fact, our uh, Honorable Finance Minister, Srimati Nirmala Sri Sitaram, also referred to this on how he was harassed in a recent parliament speech. He taught us that integrity and honesty pays much more in the long run, and he has been a source of inspiration to our family due to his convictions. I would like to give my gratitude to the IIBF and the chairman of SBI, Sri Dinesh Kumar Khara, to give me this opportunity to say a few words about late Sri R.K. Talwar. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It's time now to thank the dignitaries on the dais with a small token of appreciation for taking out their valuable time and making the event a grand success. May I now request Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, Chairman SBI and President IIBF, to hand over a memento to Dr. Anand Nageshwaran, Chief Economic Advisor, Government of India. request Mr. Bispaketan Das, CEO IIBF, to hand over a memento to Mr. Dinesh Kumar Khara, SBI Chairman and President IIBF. As we come to the end of the IS memorable event, I request Mr. Prakash Mehrotra, Director Training IIBF, to propose the vote of thanks.
respected dignitaries on the dais and off the dais. Uh, we are really privileged today to have uh, Dr. Anant Nageshwaranji along with us. And uh, he has rendered a very thoughtful uh, deliberation today. Uh, this regulation actually is a word which many a times actually confuses us or uh, sometimes uh, frightens us also. Many people actually think that if there is no regulation and we are left to our own basic principles, we will be doing better. And regulations come in the way of our uh, normal working and uh, growth. Similar thing is being considered sometimes regarding the compliances, which is naturally connected to the regulations. But uh, perhaps we have forgotten that when we live life, life itself is not possible without regulation. From our childhood, we have been told what is right, what is wrong. And uh, as we grow old, as we do more and more work, the things become complex in life. Those things actually also start becoming more and more complex while following in life. The same thing happens with the organizations uh, as I have understood. Regulations are nothing but the basic principles only on which the businesses are to be con conducted. If we follow those ethics and uh, basic principles, I don't think there will be any need for any regulation. But it doesn't happen, as you have rightly told, sir. Basic human nature is to find out sideways, to have quick progress, or many a times we become complacent, thinking we are doing everything right. And uh, that is how we sometimes harm ourselves, sometimes we cause the social harms. <laughs> and there exactly is the need for the regulation. So you have very clearly pointed out, sir, this, the basic tenets of regulation, why it is necessary. This is a natural course of life. It has to be. Rest of the things are just uh, managed as per the complexity of the environment. More number of players, more regulations will be needed. More economies we work in, more geographies we work in, more regulations. So as the complexity increases, more and more care, risk management practices have to be adopted. And uh, that is the order need of the day. That has to be done. If we don't do, we will meet actually unforeseen circumstances which may harm ourselves as well as the economy. So this particular session has actually given a lot of thoughts which we can think of. But the basics remains the same, that we have to be vigilant, we have to be careful while doing business, and we have to be fully compliant because there is no growth without compliance. We will just uh, stumble somewhere. We may grow for one or two days. Next day, we will fall down somewhere. So if in order to have a sustainable growth, whether in personal life or professional life or in an organization, we have to observe the basic principles and regulations which are there. Otherwise, there will be unforeseen circumstances. So thank you very much, sir, for giving us thoughtful uh, the thought, many ideas and thoughts to ponder upon. And a uh, lot of questions have also been asked. Uh, I thank you very much, sir, and we are grateful to you for giving your valuable time to us. I also thank uh, Dinesh Kumar Karasav, SBI chairman, who has always been a source of inspiration for us, being on our governing council and uh, heading the IIBF. <coughs> uh, I am thankful to the MDs of SBI, who are sitting off the dais, and ED of Reserve Bank of India, whom I had previous interaction also when he was a director on our board in Bank of Baroda. So thank you very much, sir, for being here and uh, sparing your valuable time. To all the August gathering, I am really thankful. And uh, thank you all once again. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. And once again, on behalf of IABF, I thank all of you all present here for attending the lecture and uh, request here all present to kindly join us for high tea at the lobby.